Uh, this is just a short introduction about myself. I'm a senior SDET in Freshdesk and uh, building and designing test frameworks and uh, also into building CI and CD pipelines. Currently, I'm working on dockerizing our microservices. So the agenda for today, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about something called CDC, which is actually consumer-driven contracts and also uh, about the implementation details of it, how it works and how it actually helps to solve the problem that I'm going to state. So before we could start, can anyone guess what this means or has anyone seen this earlier? What is it? Any guesses? Okay, so this is called the Death Star. It's actually uh, the internal architecture of the microservices in Amazon. So, in such a complex system, there arises one problem, right? Like, each team actually owns their own microservice, and they keep making changes, and there could be other services which would consume the service. So, in such a system, how do I ensure that any change that I make to my system does not actually affect the consumers? So this is the problem that we are trying to solve. So I should be able to confidently deploy my changes without breaking uh, any other services. So this is where CDC actually comes to the rescue. So what is consumer-driven contract? It is actually a pattern def defined by Martin Fowler. So in this, what actually happens is we, uh, let's take the example of two services, a provider and a consumer. Uh, actually, the, the consumer defines a contract saying, hey, this is the kind of request that I would uh, send you, and this is the response that I expect from you. So uh, this is the contract defined by the consumer, and it actually establishes a, a, a pact or a contract. And every time the provider makes any change to his system, he needs to adhere to it saying, okay, so this is the contract that I have with my consumers, and I need to make sure that this actually uh, is intact, and my change does not break the contract. So there are various implementations of this concept, uh, meaning there are various tools which actually implement this consumer-driven contract, and one such tool is PACT. So PACT is nothing but an open source library and it's available in uh, various flavors of uh, languages. There are other tools uh, called Pacto, Janus, and uh, Spring Cloud Contract as well. So um, Spring Cloud is actually a Java implementation of it. So, so as I said, Pact is an open source library and it's available in various uh, languages. And these are the two flavors that we use, the Ruby and the NPM modules. And it's available in other languages as well. And this is actually used for asynchronous integration tests. So I would get, I'll shortly get to it, why it is called asynchronous. Um, let's first see how it works. So, okay, uh, again, what, what I would say is like it is as simple as unit tests, but then it's as powerful as end-to-end -end tests or integration tests. Uh, let's see how uh, it actually validates this statement. So for this um, talk, I'm going to take two services called the Dev Portal and the Activity Service. So uh, I actually work with a team uh, called Marketplace Team, which is into the business of building and providing SDKs for uh, uh, SDKs using which apps can be written. Uh, these apps can actually run on top of Freshdesk. Uh, um, uh, on top of Freshdesk, so uh, there's a dev portal where the developers can submit the app. And the activity service, it just records all the uh, activities that happens in the dev portal. So in this example, activities is the provider, and dev portal is the consumer. So 
let me just take you over what happens on the consumer side and what happens on the provider side, how these tests are actually implemented. So on the consumer side, we have a bunch of tests. These are actually the pack tests. What do they do? They actually start a, a, a mock pack provider. So in our case, the provider is the activities service, right? So it actually starts a mock uh, provider for activities. And you have the code. So the first step that happens is it sets the expectations on the provider. So what do I mean by setting expectations is, uh, before the tests could start, it would actually tell the provider, hey, this is the kind of request that I would give you. And if I give such a request, you are uh, expected to return such a response. So such expectations are set. The test sign works. And it's sent to the mock provider. And the expected responses are received. And it's, again, asserted on the uh, other side. So if you actually take a closer look at it, it's nothing much different from the usual unit tests that we write, correct? Because uh, again, we are actually mocking the provider, and uh, we are trying to run the tests. But then how is it actually different from the usual unit tests? So if you actually see, what happens is, all the tests that are run on the pro uh, consumer side, it actually gets recorded at the background. All this is actually done by the PACT tool. And it gets written into a file called the packed file. So the packed file, it's, uh, it's actually a collection of all re requests and response between two services. And it's nothing but a JSON file. Yeah. And uh, basically, it actually uh, uh, contains all of these details, like the endpoints, the query params that are uh, needed, the header, and the response object that I received. So now that we have the packed file, let's see how it's actually used on the provider side. So on the provider side, I have the packed file and I have my service. So uh, once I uh, start the tests on the provider side, what happens is it would actually replay every HTTP request that is present in the packed file. And uh, the provider would actually respond with the real responses. And this response is, again, uh, validated against the response that I already have in my packed file. So this is how we actually ensure that the contract between the provider and the consumer is not broken. So if everything goes well, it returns a su uh, success. Otherwise, it fails. So. Uh, Unless and until you actually verify the pact on the provider side, just generating the pact alone would not help and uh, help us in any way. Only this uh, verification actually ensures this integration, right? And if you uh, actually notice, um, in this way of testing, we uh, we are not actually bringing up both the services in at at a at a time, right? So uh, both are actually independent, and they they need not be up and running for these tests to happen. So that's where actually pack tests actually differ from the traditional ways of integration tests. Yeah, the pack file can be shared in various ways. And these are a few ways in which it can be shared. One is using the file system, which is like just uh, if you have both the services in the same file system, you can just share the file path. Or uh, if you have a, a CI pipeline defined for each of your microservices, then you can just have these uh, pack verification and pack generation steps as a part uh, of your uh, build pipeline and publish them as the artifact. Or you can store the pack file in the cloud, maybe S3. Or there's something called the pack broker, which is again a different uh, module, again provided by the pack tool itself. Uh, this is nothing but a repo for collecting all the pack files. So basically, it has other features added to it as well, something like a webhook, which would invoke the other uh, dependent services every time there's a change. Or you can even tag the packed files, saying this version of it belongs to the prod, and this, this ver version belongs to the staging, uh, and so on. So those uh, features available in the pack broker. So as you can see, uh, the various advantages that comes added are it actually eliminates wrong assumptions between teams. 
uh, because all of the specifications are present in the PACT file itself and the agreement is clearly defined and it enables communication. Every time there is a uh, test failure, it means that the pact is not being kept and it can be, uh, the teams can communicate about it. And if you can see, uh, the time to set up this is actually very less. Um, so what I mean by this is maybe you can have, you might have the initial learning curve, uh, but then the, you, you will not be spending time in uh, setting up the servers and so on. So otherwise, if you actually consider the traditional ways of doing it, what you would do is like you would actually check into maybe one of the branches staging or and you set up the complete staging stack. All of that could be avoided uh, if you use this. No, no extra infrastructure. Yes, and this is one of the main advantages. It's kind of a self-help self tool for the dependent services. You need not start the dependent service to test the integration. It executes very fast, as fast as unit tests. And it fails fast. Yes, this is an, again a very uh, important point to note because uh, you're not even actually integrating, you're not checking in your code. Even before you could check in, you can be very sure that you're not breaking any integrations between your services. And no flakiness, like uh, in, you, in the traditional ways of testing, you might have some flaky tests due to environmental issues. All that could be avoided and it's easy to debug as well. So I'm just going to go over a short demo, not exactly a demo, I'm just going to uh, show a few code snippets of our Ruby implementation. Um, so this is what happens on the consumer side. So we are actually setting up the mock server. Um, and again, here I'm using the tool called the Pact, uh, the Ruby gem actually. So uh, this is the service consumer, the dev portal and it actually has a pact with activities which is its provider and this act activities is actually started i mean a mock service of the activities is started in port 3005 and this is where i set my expectations so this is the request that i'm going to send to my mock provider uh, so uh, this has all of the information available, like the path, the query params, the header, etc. So this is what we set in the mock provider. So if it gets such a request, then it has to respond with the response that we see here, which is a status 422 and the header and with the body uh, with the specific error message. Yeah, this is the... Uh, snippet to actually make the call and when this call actually is made this is when uh, the request is triggered to the mock provider and this is when it actually gets recorded to the packed file. So this is actually a sample packed file. This is how a packed file would look like. As you can see, you, ha you can see the consumer and the provider and also the uh, interactions is nothing but the set of all HTTP requests and responses. So uh, for this example, I've just taken one such request. So this is how a packed file would look like. And this is what is being used on the provider side. So on the provider side, uh, what we do is like uh, the provider is activities and it has to honor the pact with dev portal. And what we need to specify is just this, the path where it can find the packed file. and all of the replaying of the HTTP request, all of that is actually uh, taken care of by the PACT tool itself. Once you do a PACT verify, uh, it would either pass or fail based on the uh, uh, results. So this is how, uh, uh, if, if there is a failure, it would actually uh, specify where it has failed and why it has failed. Uh, this is a sample uh, failure, uh, this is how a sample failure would look like. So there are three parameters which it would check. One is the status code of the re response that it receives and uh, checks whether the body is matching and also the headers. Yeah, if everything goes well, then it would actually uh, succeed and this is how it would look like. Yeah, so, uh, 
And these are a few references which uh, you can check and look at uh, to learn about consumer driven contracts. And to know more about PACT's uh, PAC tool as such, you can actually look into PACT.io. Uh, they have a very good documentation available as well. So uh, that's pretty much it. So questions? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, can we mock uh, intermittent failures using this? Intermittent failures? Yeah. Uh, like what? So, uh, if I want to test uh, how my service is going to handle uh, the scenarios where the provider is down or uh, a retry kind of scenario, can I do that in this? Mm, so, these actually. Uh, only the interactions could be tested between services, okay. which are actually HTTP requests and responses. So, if the uh, what kind of failures could be tested is like if the uh, dependent service is going to respond with a error error message or something like that, that could be tested, but not for standalone services. Mm. It's actually meant to test the interaction between services. Uh, right, but uh, I would like to test cases wherein the uh, provider service uh, responds correctly mm. and also the cases where the provider service uh, uh, may not respond in the way that I am originally expecting. I mean, uh, let's say a network outage or something like that. So, so, does it return a response object, error response at least? Uh, may or may not. So, if it returns, that could be tested. If it doesn't, then doesn't, I can't. No. Hi. You deal with one scenario. Sometimes, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, how the tool works, uh, that the uh, real life responses are recorded, and then the in the test you compare against that response. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes the responses have uh, fields like timestamps, which yeah. vary all the time, right? Yes. So, does the tool allow you to ignore certain fields? Yes. Uh, so, you can actually, uh, there are ways to specify or regex for certain fields like the one you said or for uh, actual time and date or ID. So, all that is available as a part of the tools feature. And how about where, uh, you know, ne you need the response of, uh, you need one response and based on that you make the next request. So, like a change request, yeah. is it? Okay. So, in that case, you'll have to write different sets of uh, contracts, like contract tests for different uh, services. Like say, if you have service A, B and C, A talks to B, B talks to C, and again, C sends a request uh, response back to B, and then B responds to A. In such a scenario, you'll actually have to write a set of tests between A and B, and then another set of tests between B and C. Mm -hmm. 